thank you so much for meeting with me today and uh, talking about your new album. I mean, as we all know, you had your big international breakthrough with your debut album, Amir. Did you feel kind of pressured going into production with the second one? I wouldn't say pressure from outside, but rather pressure from within. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, when I started writing the songs for this new album, it flowed rather well. Mm -hmm. I, it flowed better than I expected, basically. And uh, I wrote more songs than I thought I would. In the end, uh, the moment the songs were written, it was actually a very pleasant uh, process mm -hmm. of going into the studio. and. Uh, it was very playful, very experimental, and a lot of amazing musicians that we invited in the studio. So. I read online that for your first album you collaborated with uh, an Arab music collective. Did you also work with them on Zahar? Uh, one musician of theirs played on Zahar. Uh, he's, he's called Tamem. He played uh, the Ne. Uh, Egyptian flute. Yeah, yeah. The only other Arabic instrument on the new album is the oud, which I play myself ah. this time. Yeah. Have you always known how to play it, or did you just like recently learned how to play I it? I learned pretty recently. Like I would say, three years ago, I I really started mm -hmm. uh, playing it. Yeah. Can you maybe tell me a little bit about the production process of your new album? Like, when did you start? Was it during Corona? Was it before already? Uh, where did you produce it or uh, where did you write the songs? So, I think we were on tour in, in, uh, in March 2020. And then, of course, we weren't anymore. <laughs> uh, everybody had to go home. So, it was a good time to uh have an existential crisis oh, perfect and, uh, <laughs> timing <laughs> and then after a couple of weeks i started writing and it was great mm -hmm. it was it was fun and i honestly the whole <laughs> that whole um, pandemic was for me personally i know for the world it wasn't mm -hmm. uh, a good thing but for me personally it was it was good uh, i spent a lot of time with friends and family mm -hmm. not living out of a suitcase that was that was nice yeah. So I, I wrote most of the songs in, in those couple of months, mm -hmm. but then some ideas came from, from yeah, years before that I dug up and was like, ah, this is not bad actually, and maybe I should finish it or, or change it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then recording was in between like my studio, I mean, my home, <laughs> basically, I don't have a studio. And PJ's home studio, uh, he's, uh, he's one of the producers. And mm -hmm. then, and then uh, uh, together, we also went to ICP in Brussels, which is uh, like a very legendary studio in, uh, in Belgium. That's and, cool. Uh, yeah, it was a ni nice, nice room. Speaking of touring and not being able to tour, you just recently had your first North American tour, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, it was... It was actually the second... Oh, I'm sorry, then the, my... <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I, we, did, we did one tour in 2019 mm -hmm. in, in America, which was nice. And then the second one was actually supposed to be in March 2020. I see. Of okay. which we did only two shows. Mm. And then this was a finishing up of that one. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, with extra shows. Yeah. How was that experience for you? And maybe, because I was wondering, would you say there are differences between like a US audience and a European audience? I'd say there's differences between every audience uh, from, from anywhere. I mean, you, you definitely notice cultural differences, but on this tour, we often play two nights in a row in mm -hmm. the same venue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've noticed differences between crowds then as well. So it's hard to say whether it is cultural sometimes or whether it's, uh, it's just a coincidence. Always. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to point the finger on or to uh, put the finger on what it is exactly. But yeah, there, there, are, there are notable differences, I guess. Yeah. Did you have like a favorite show in the USA? Yeah, yeah, I did, but it, but it has nothing to do with the audience. Often, okay. it's 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 got much to do with with how I feel and how I'm feeling at that time. I felt like we played a really good show in Atlanta, or it, it was a solo tour, so it was just me on stage. So I should maybe say I, but 
but that's also not true because we have a sound and light guy with us, so we we are we. we but are. it was mostly just you on stage, right? It was just me on stage, yeah, yeah that's true. But I don't know, I, I really liked uh, Atlanta, I really liked the last New York show as well. Oh yeah. yeah. Before the release of your second album, you kind of stepped away from social media for a while, right? How was that for you? Mm, I think it's healthy for everybody to, mm. to do that sometimes. Uh, but did it have like a special reason or was it just I like... I would okay. prefer not to be on it anyway. Okay. But I accept <laughs> that, that, that the times have changed and that we, I mean, the times have changed. Like I come from this <laughs> prehistoric age. No, I, I grew up in it, of course. I grew up with it. P purely from a creative point of view, it's just a distraction. That, yeah. that's, that's basically the, the main reason why, why I deleted it off my phone. It's because I was looking at it. It, it, was, it was not about the communicating. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a bit also that as aspect, but it was mainly the, just me anytime I have, and still now, now that it's back on my phone, anytime there's a, a dead yeah. moment, I, yep. There yeah, I totally get that. I, I'm the same. Yeah, I mean, yeah. everybody. Everybody's yeah, the yeah, same. Yeah, it's there's. It is designed for you to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, but I think that's a that's a very interesting thesis that it like kills creativity because I also think yeah. that may be the case. Yeah, because I feel like I'm personally I'm writing a lot, yeah. and when I'm on social media too much, I don't get like creative impulses. I f I feel like it's like that, but. Yeah, I guess it's like the the natural impulses you yeah. would get from moments of boredom. Mm -hmm. They are lost to, yeah, to to other yeah. impulses. Yeah, <laughs> true. Are, yeah, yeah. Okay, but uh, let's talk about your new album because when I was listening to uh, the Flame and You Don't Own Me, there were a few lines like uh, in the Flame you sing. All I know is where I saw away, you saw the worst in me. And in You Don't Owe Me, there's the line, even when there's none to blame, you always shout my name. And I feel like these songs, I felt like these songs are about a kind of problematic or toxic relationship. Um, but I wanted to know if, if that's really the case or it was just like my interpretation of it. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's important to me, I guess, to keep people's interpretations as in, intact as possible. Because every time I say something about it, I feel like it in a way overrules that, which is not good. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I prefer, I mean, but I can say that for me, the, the, I didn't really have a person in mind for to, okay. when I wrote those songs. But yeah, like You Don't Owe Me, for example, is a, is a song that, that when I wrote it, I felt I think my mind was just at, at just with the concept of freedom and, and, uh, and oppression. And, yeah, um, yeah it's, it could also be a political song if you read it, it in a different be, way. It could be, yes, it, it could be, it's, it's basically a call for freedom. It's a plea for freedom. It's in, 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 in any possible way. And, and I, f I feel like any individual or group that like that feels oppressed or that feels like they need a call for freedom, they could claim mm -hmm. that song. I thought that yeah. was important to me. Uh, so many people will have or can relate to that feeling of oppression in, in their own way. Like mm -hmm. you say, like it could be in a relationship. It could be, it could be uh, to, towards a government. It could be a yeah. uh, group. I, I don't know. It's uh, yeah. And that's actually what I like very much about your songs because you can really read into them whatever you want to read into them and and because your words are very poetic in a way it it leaves the mind open for uh, interpretation and oh, that's great thank you yeah. thank you for saying that. <laughs> i also read that you don't own me was inspired by the book men's search for meaning is that yeah. true yeah I, I mean that that was partly why my mind was you know going on about those concepts because because of reading that book mm -hmm. Uh, which I thought was so inspiring, um, reading his thoughts on, on that whole thing. And on, um, I mean, he basically survived the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Yeah. The reasons for surviving it, or at least his interpretation of why he was able to, I, was, uh, I thought was very inspiring. A couple of sentences from that book just like 
stayed with you. Yeah, it was there was something of like even when you're when you're oppressed in that way and and you are you you have to suffer immensely. Like you can mm -hmm. still in in a way choose your attitude. Yeah, you can find was, your meaning yes, in life, yeah. even though it's like the worst situation yeah. you could ever bear. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's precisely that meaning that will that might get you through it. And, and yeah. it's, his is a very extreme example of, of mm -hmm. suffering, but any, every every human being suffers in, yeah. in their lifetimes. And it's and I think we all have to find those those little acts of meaning to, to get through that suffering or to find the motivation to get through it. And yeah. Uh, yeah. That's really extraordinary if you can find that strength in yourself to survive like the worst thing just with your attitude towards life. That's it's true, but it's it's what many people do without being conscious about it. Mm -hmm. And that's also beautiful. I think a lot of we all we are all acting out little acts of faith in, in um, not in a, in a God, but just faith in, in life, basically, mm -hmm. uh, by getting through those things and, and uh, yeah, yeah, by sharing the love. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I have to say, You Don't Owe Me is, I would say, my favorite song from the whole album. I also love A Drop of Blood. And I wanted to talk to you about The First Disciple, which mm -hmm. I also really like. Again, my interpretation of the song was like, how to deal with the changes that maybe success brings, um, because there's also the line, I'm afraid that no amount of fame will ever wash away the shame of not knowing how to love your only friend who will love you till the end. So I was wondering, are you afraid that the, too much success will change you or is it maybe something that already happened to you? So this song, well, it's, it's written towards a person basically. Yeah. Uh, so it's, the two main uh, main interpretations would be sung towards a friend or sung towards oneself. Yeah, that's what uh, I was also thinking. Yeah. And in a way, it's like it's both because it's it's I guess it's sung towards to, towards idols of mine, basically. Mm -hmm. Like um, one one author I I had in mind while while I was, no, not actually not really while I was writing, it was more, mostly afterwards that I had that, that interpretation myself, was that uh, th there's this writer, Khalil Gibran, who really inspired me, mm -hmm. especially when I was a teenager. When I read The Prophet for the first time, which is his most famous work, I, I almost mm -hmm. thought like, ah, yeah, this, this man, he must have been like, the character in his book to, to be able to write stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But then later in life, very recently, I, I read more about his actual life, you know, mm -hmm. and about how he was very much conflicted and how, how, yeah, he was in a duality of how he was perceived versus how he actually was. And, yeah. how, uh, and I thought that was tragically beautiful in a way because or proceeding in my own like life yeah. and, and career and whatever, those things combined, mm -hmm. I think, uh, are very much like in that song. Yeah. Um, it's just, I mean, also the, the first disciple is basically, yeah, the the first person to believe in you, mm -hmm. and if if you would interpret that song as being sung towards yourself, then the first person to believe in you is yourself, is, 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 you, is like a very pure... Yeah, that's true. You know, thing yeah. within you that really... This song is especially difficult to, um, to explain, basically, or to, to, to give my point of view without making it all fall apart. You know? Yeah, and I mean, you don't always have to explain every song. I mean, that's no, also... No, that's no, true. The title of the album is Zahar. Um, and when I Googled it, it said that it's, uh, it, it means dawn, something like dawn. So why did you choose uh, the title? Like, what does it mean to you? I think it can also be translated as just before dawn. Ah, okay. Which I thought was like that, that specific uh, translation mm -hmm. I thought was really um, really fitting and beautiful because if uh, I mean it's not a concept album it, there's just a bunch of songs that I mm. threw together uh, and I just looked for a common feeling to them basically mm -hmm. and I thought they all 
they all felt very, they all seemed to be in a very reflective state. Uh, and that reflective state conjures up like an in-between realm for me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, what, when I, uh, when Sahar became like a possible title, I was like, yeah, that's, that's nice because just before dawn is, is that in a is way that like most reflective state maybe yeah yeah and it's also an in-between state yeah, of, that's true. of the day you know where it's not really day it's not really night mm -hmm. and um i like that yeah it, it was just it was sort of it, it brought them all together like yeah, yeah that that's really beautiful <laughs> as an as an idea <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a first name it's a it's a girl's name oh and really yeah no, okay. no. My father, when I told him, hey, do you think it's a good title? You know, he's like, oh yeah, yeah, it's really good. But a lot of people are going to be like, who is Sahar? <laughs> yeah, <she's, laughs> who is she? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, no one in my life. At least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When your first EP came out in 2018, I think, uh, you were only like 22 years old. Mm -hmm. So now it's been like four years. Um, Makes me sound very old. Oh no, you're not. <laughs> I'm 25 myself, so <laughs> I know the struggle. <laughs> um, um, but what effect did it maybe have on you to become famous at such a young age? I mean, 22, that's really, that's really young. I don't really regard myself as a famous person. It's also, yeah, it's a because very uh, difficult word. No. I, we also, yeah, due to social media and all that, like fame can be very concentrated in mm -hmm. bubbles. So you could be recognized in, let's say, three very specific streets of a city, mm -hmm. and then all the rest of the city won't recognize. Like you know, it's a, and and it's the same. I mean, if I think of really like fame in the in the classical sense mm -hmm. of the of the word, and then I then I really think of these people that everybody's heard the name of or yeah. would recognize on the street and people who actually cannot go anywhere without being you know photographed or followed or harassed or whatever and uh and i, I don't have that life i, I have a very quiet life I basically mm. uh, outside of uh, playing shows and of course it, at shows it's it's quite it can be overwhelming because mm -hmm. then then that's another concentrated yeah. bubble yeah. where so many people who actually know you and who know your work come together and and, and wants to sell want to celebrate yeah, well, yeah, it yeah exactly and that's a it's a beautiful happening yeah but uh i always i always remind myself that it's uh, basically the music we're celebrating and and it's funny because it the work itself is something you disassociate from uh, mm -hmm. after a while like you i mean of course i i know i, I wrote the songs at one point <laughs> in my life but but since you evolve, mm -hmm. you also don't really feel like you're the same person anymore. So in a way, you're you're singing someone else's songs, mm -hmm. which is quite liberating, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I like the idea of like concentrated fame because when I I was, for example, looking at your Instagram, it that's it's also a bubble in a way. It's right? also a bubble, and I think it's it's not representative of of uh, merely of yeah of how many people would would actually come to see you at a, at a show because they're and that that's something that does blow my mind is when i see like uh, shows being sold out or mm -hmm. um uh, or when we're playing at a, a festival and there's like a tent and it's full like there's actually people there mm -hmm. that th those things they actually blow my mind because it's yeah much more physical it's mm -hmm. much more in your face i guess yeah. um yeah. and how is it like in your hometown for example or in in belgium like do you get recognized a lot on the street well but the the thing is but i i, I i'm guessing it's similar in germany it's like people are very reserved you know yeah. so very uh so y yes but they they are very polite and they mm -hmm. they they might come up to say something but but not often it, it's it's a lot of whispering mm -hmm. it's a lot of <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that really yeah yeah, yeah. But I'm 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 also a bit blind to it at the same time. So it's it's often like friends of mine or my brother or whatever is like noticing it. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you want to talk about this because that's probably like the most asked question. But your grandfather mm -hmm. um, is like one of the most famous musicians and actors uh, in Egypt. Uh, was um, yeah. sorry. 
so how did his career also influence your own or do you compare yourself a lot with him and his career or not at all? Not really. I mean, we started at a similar age, uh, but the thing is that I have no memories of him and that's, that's like the, all that I know about him is from stories or mm -hmm. from, from other people. Basically. So my, I, I knew him, but I was too young to remember. Mm -hmm. Uh, or his career is uh, is not a career that I compare to often. Yeah. Uh, also because it was so it's so different, you know, a, a, a totally different uh, time mm. and, and, and a totally different place. True. Yeah, musically, I I I, um, I love his work and, and it has definitely been an, an influence mm -hmm. on, on mine. But so has been a lot of Arabic music. When I did my research um, about you, or like. I don't know, read a lot of reviews about your albums. Um, I often came across the term oriental of your mm -hmm. music. And well, I studied cultural studies and in oh. cultural studies, it's a very problematic term because it's uh, a colonialist or orientalism, one. Yeah. yeah, Orientalism, Edward Said, it's like a yeah, very problematic term. So I was wondering, what do you maybe think about the way Western press writes about your music? No, I, I personally haven't really been bothered by it. I think what's funny to me is when that's made the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas to me, it's like I acknowledge that I have influences from from there. I'm happy to show them. Like I, I play the oud on stage, for example. Yeah. But uh, but uh, but to me, it's it's not what makes a song necessarily worthwhile to listen to. Mm -hmm. It's much more about what feeling it gives you. For me, it's, it can be like, it's more of a color in a way. I see it as a, a, a color that's not even in every song. And it's weird that maybe the focus is too much on mm -hmm. a, a certain, a specific color that is used instead of just the, the core of the work. Yeah. But I understand and at the same time, it's like, there's so much music, there's so mm -hmm. much people want to, I mean, journalists and all that, they want to draw you in with a... Yeah, a, they want to define a, it in a way. With a, yeah, also. that's simple and but, but attractive enough to... Yeah. I understand it, but, but of course, if when you're having like an, an actual conversation like this one, then, then you can yeah, go more into detail and clarify stuff. And I mm -hmm. much prefer that always, but uh, yeah. Thank you so much thank you. Uh, for talking to me today. So yeah, thank it was really lovely. A, <laughs> yeah, thank you for a lovely conversation. Thank you.